hey, so uh, spoilers for Andor, by the way, not enough people watched that show. And if you're one of those people, um, rectify that and grow and change as a person. So I had some thoughts that I wanted to toss around with you guys. And since I've been working my ass off on a Clone Wars video that's longer than the last span of time in which I was happy, I figured I'd take a break and have another stab at talking about my favorite Star Wars show, Andor. I did my review for the show back at the beginning of this year, but due to the fact that I wasn't quite ready yet to do another deep dive into a Star War after just finishing my Kenobi breakdowns, it was pretty short and I definitely don't feel I did the show justice. But I'm still not playing to do a full breakdown of all 12 episodes of Andor at the moment because I'm still not ready to devote the amount of time it would take to do that properly, especially while I'm still working on a big video. So I thought instead I could pick my favorite arc on the show and talk about why I think it works so well. Though I will admit that that's not the only reason I decided to do this video, and there's something else I want to address. You see, I keep seeing this odd notion that's becoming more and more apparent, which is that plot doesn't matter just so long as there are good themes being presented in a story. And without naming any names, that's largely due to a specific fan base for a certain movie that's changed a lot of the online discourse surrounding film for the past five, almost six years now. So while the goal here is to praise a show that I really love and break down an arc that I consider to be extremely well written, I also want to explain why its use of cause and effect, logical consistency, and other handy writing tools that make for a strong plot serve to enhance the themes that the story is ultimately going for. And then because I'm a grumpy old man who hates fun, I want to take a look at an example from that one movie I was just talking about and explain how it does... Y you know, the opposite of that. Alright, let's go. In the Narkina 5 arc, we follow Cassian into an Imperial prison with a very unique and creative design that allows the officers running the facility to have minimal involvement with the inmates, while still maintaining consistent productivity from them as they're forced to work making contraptions they don't understand and for what purpose they don't know. They're able to do this by rigging the floors to electrify the barefoot inmates anytime they're not compliant, and activating a heat floor during the middle of the night so that anyone who tries to leave their cell will be killed instantly. Like I said, it's really cool and creative, but it's also theoretically a very practical system that allows the Empire to maintain control here without having to expend a large number of officers. They're able to mostly keep to themselves, enforce their rules whenever necessary, and the work is done all the same. And as an added bit of incentive, the workers are also motivated to get as much done in a single shift as they can, as the table with the least amount of machines built at the end of the day will get electrocuted, and the table that was the most productive will be rewarded rewarded with flavor in their weird food tube things. It's relatively simple, but it accomplishes many things at the same time, both functionally and narratively. Like I said, it allows the Imperials to maintain control over the prisoners by turning their work into a competition against one another, so they'll be too busy fighting each other and too tired by the end of the day to even think about escaping. But on a larger thematic scale, it ties in wonderfully with the point that this show makes about how oppression is contingent on keeping people divided, when if they were to put aside their differences and fears and band together, they would become a force too great for even the Empire to stop. Tyranny requires constant effort. Authority is brittle. Oppression is the mask of fear. The prisoner who best exemplifies this is Kino Loy, played brilliantly by the one and only Andy Serkis. He's such a great actor, it's a wonder it took them this long to put him in a Star Wars thing. Take that ridiculous thing. Kino is the day shift manager on level 5 where Cassian is assigned to work. His introductory scene establishes right off the bat that he has 249 days left of my sentence. And he firmly believes as long as he does what he's told and keeps his crew in line, he'll get to go home when that sentence is up. Throughout the arc, it becomes increasingly clear that something went wrong on one of the other levels, but given the way these prisoners are divided, their access to information is limited and severely delayed. They know something happened on level 2, but they don't know what, and all they have to go on are rumors. Rumors that Kino is quick to dismiss, even to the point of becoming aggressive, because he's staunchly in denial that the system might have failed. That system is the only thing getting him to the end of his sentence, and he's not about to risk causing unrest when he's so close to the end. Every time Cassian tries to get him to reveal information so that he can better plan his escape, Kino shuts him down. He doesn't want to involve himself into anything that'll get him into trouble. It's only when one of the inmates at Cassian's table, Olaf, has a stroke, because he's old, 
old and he's being overworked, that things take a turn for the worst. Olaf only has 40 days left of his sentence, and now suddenly he's reached his end. And when a medic arrives from a different level, Cassian and Kino are able to find out more information. He tells them that there was a clerical error. Evidently, someone who was released on level 4 ended up back on level 2 the next day, and the guards ended up having to fry the whole floor so as to try to prevent word from spreading. It's at this point that Kino realizes that this hope he's been clinging to to get him through the rest of his sentence is a lie, and always has been. When you finish your sentence, you don't get sent home, you get sent somewhere else to live out the rest of your days in a cage, working until you die. This is the moment Kino realizes... No one is getting out! And this is when he joins in on Cassian's plan to escape. Cassian and the other prisoners have observed that the elevator isn't hooked up to the rest of the system, which means that if they can jam it while it's halfway down, they should be able to climb up and take out the guards. But seeing as the guards rarely come down unless they have to, they figured their best bet was to wait for a new prisoner to be released onto the floor. And now that Olaf is dead and will need to be replaced, the opportunity has arisen, but they'll need to work fast. Cassian has also spent the last several months filing away at a water pipe in the facilities, and he gets it to burst and leak out onto the workfloor. This way, when the plan is enacted and the inmates start taking up arms against the guards, they go to spark the floor and end up short-circuiting the entire system on their level. Now that the floor is cold, the prisoners are able to make a dash toward the top, and while many of them die in the process, they're able to overwhelm the guards by sheer numbers easily enough, thanks to the lax security in this place that I mentioned earlier. Once they've taken control of their level, Cassian and Kino make for the main control room and force the officers inside to disable the systems facility-wide, causing all the floors to go cold and allowing the rest of the prisoners an opportunity to escape as well. And this is all aided by the absolutely riveting speech Kino gives to inspire the prisoners to rise up, during which he repeats something that Cassian told him in the previous episode. I'd rather die trying to take them down than die giving them what they want. And I would rather die trying to take them down than giving them what they want. This causes Cassian to realize the impact that his words have, and that he has the power to inspire people to stand up and band together toward a common enemy. Like I already said, the larger theme of this show is that the Empire, for all its power and its resources and seemingly endless reach, wouldn't be enough to stop a reckoning if only the people would put aside their fear and come together. The prisoners in this facility would have spent the rest of their lives in these brutal conditions, too afraid to change their situation for fear of punishment but the mask slipped. A simple mistake revealed the truth of the matter, that the Imperial need for control is so desperate because it is so unnatural. So as we've just observed, this is how you write a story where a consistently written plot following cause and effect is able to communicate rich themes as well as deepen character arcs. Simply by having them respond to the situation they're in in ways that they actually would, and making sure that said situation feels natural and uncontrived, we're able to appreciate the thematic throughline of these episodes and the show at large. Of course, that's an example of it done well, but as it so happens, sometimes writing is bad. And I know it's cliche at this point to to talk about The Last Jedi, as by now pretty much every argument has been haggled over tirelessly, but the thing is that these two have a pretty overlapping fan base because they're both seen as thematically rich, complex character studies that explore the deeper nuances of morality and what it means to be a hero. But unlike The Last Jedi, Andor actually is able to back up its themes with a strong plot, and so I find it frustrating when people put them in the same league. For the last six years, anytime I find myself sentenced to a TLJ discussion with someone who who likes the film, the debate always deviates one way or another to them telling me that I just can't appreciate the themes. And when I try to explain that it's because the themes are contradicted by the plot itself and therefore not communicated effectively, they shut me down and tell me to leave the funeral because I'm not part of the family and wasn't even invited and seem to not have even known the deceased. Ideally, what I'd like to accomplish here is to showcase how, yes, we mean TLJ haters do appreciate strong themes and ideas when done well, and that's why I just spent all that time singing the praises of Andor. Conversely, however, let's take a look at an arc that always particularly frustrated me, because it directly contradicts, in no uncertain terms, the ideas that The Last Jedi wanted to get across. And that is the entire character arc of Poe Dameron. Now I'm gonna mostly skip past the opening battle here, because while it does factor into Poe's arc in the film and feeds into the overall theme they're 
they're clearly going for with him. It's also extremely tedious to talk about at length. Basically, his disobedience of a direct order from Leia causes them to lose their entire bombing fleet, and the film treats this as a failure on Poe's part because of the lives and resources that were lost. This was, of course, in service to bringing down one of the most powerful ships in the First Order fleet, but I guess Leia doesn't see the loss of the bombers as worth the risk, and so she demotes him. This is also putting to one side the fact that the bombers in question were so horrifically stupid in their design that they were practically created to fail, and it doesn't really make sense that they exist and are being used by the Resistance in lieu of Y-Wing bombers, which are much more effective and don't all immediately blow up in a chain reaction when just one of them is hit. How the fledgling Rebellion was able to get a hold of these ships but the Resistance, which was until very recently being funded by what was the standing government weren't, I'll never know. Regardless, what I really want to talk about is the rivalry between Poe and Admiral Holdo, the infamous Holdo doesn't tell Poe the plan debacle. For the most part, I'm actually completely fine with her refusing to tell just anyone her plan, since we have to infer that she probably thinks there's some sort of spy on board. I mean, the film doesn't give us that information, but the fact that the First Order managed to track their fleet through light speed would probably make me suspicious of that, too. And thanks to the annoying space battle I mentioned earlier, Holdo doesn't trust Poe because he's a hotshot flyboy who's impulsive, dangerous, and the last thing we need right now. Already we've run into a bit of trouble, seeing as the opening had to seriously contrive events in such a way that Poe might fuck up enough for Leia to demote him, and Holdo to therefore not want to trust him, but whatever. This is our premise. These two don't like or trust each other, and since Poe doesn't know what the plan is to get the fleet away from the First Order, he jumps at the first opportunity to subvert her after Finn and Rose come to him with their own idea. So what I'd like to do is take a look at each of the plans and see which one actually makes sense when looking at it with any level of scrutiny beyond what the film wants you to think of them. Finn realizes that the First Order are able to track them through light speed because of a newly implemented hyperspace tracking technology, which he apparently knows about because he used to be stationed on Snoke's flagship. Now, putting aside the fact that this means Finn was, during the time he was a stormtrooper, somehow stationed in the three most important places in the entire First Order without having ever seen a single battle before The Force Awakens, and the fact that he apparently knew this technology was a thing but said nothing to the rest of these characters and seemed surprised when they'd been found, the plan is this. He and Rose will sneak past the First Order fleet and disable the tracker without them knowing it's down, giving the Resistance just enough time to jump to safety. By the time the First Order realize the tracker is down, they'll be well away. To do this, they have to go to Canto Bight and find someone who can hack his way through the First Order sensors, which leads to a whole bunch of bullshit that we can thankfully just skip past. What happens is that they fail to find the Master Codebreaker, but instead they find some random guy in a cell who has the exact same skill set, and he gets them onto the Supremacy, only for them to get extremely unlucky by being spotted by a droid, which causes them to get caught. Now, right off the bat, the one major critique I have with this plan is that it's all pretty reliant on sneaking away to some casino in hopes of maybe finding a guy that Maz told them about who can maybe help them get onto the First Order ship. The chances of them actually finding the Master Codebreaker, him deciding to help, and them getting the mission done before the First Order are able to catch up to the Resistance are all extremely low. And even further, it's a contrivance and a half that, despite failing to get the Master Codebreaker, they just happen to meet some random guy in the same cell they were thrown in who has the skills they were looking for. But all that being said, Poe didn't really have any other options because he wasn't informed of the plan and he had no idea if there even was one because nobody will tell him anything. The survival of everything and everyone he cares about rests on them getting away from the First Order and with the information that he has, this is the best possible chance of survival. So I think it's fine that Poe is willing to take this risk. Aside from that though, this plan is honestly pretty good and the only reason it fails is because some random droid just so happens to spot them and alert Phasma, who intercepts them just before they can reach the tracker. Again, talk about a contrivance. This was insanely unlucky for our heroes, and the likelihood of it happening would have been astronomically low, but the film has a message it wants to convey and a horribly contrived arc to send Poe on, so it had to be done. Now let's compare this plan to the one Holdo came up with. Are you fueling up the transports? So we eventually find out that Holdo plans to take what little fuel they have left and transfer it to these tiny, undefended transports to be ferried down to the planet Crate, which they've been slowly flying toward this entire movie. These transports have no shields nor any way to arm themselves, but if they stay on the Rattus, they'll die for sure. And I guess Holdo is hoping that somehow the First Order won't see these ships, despite the fact that 
you know, anyone looking out the window would have a hard time missing them. But she does actually turn out to be right about that, so, I don't know, maybe there's extra information we aren't given that makes that make sense. And don't worry, we are gonna get to the fact that the only reason the First Order found out about Holdo's plan is because Finn and Rose failed on their end, but for now, I really want to just stress the sheer stupidity of this plan. Even if we're accepting that the First Order somehow wouldn't have seen or detected the transports as they were making their way down to Crate, they would still be able to see that Crate was obviously the intended destination for the Radis, and it used to be an old rebel base, so that's gonna cause some questions. The mineral planet Crate, an uncharted hideout from the days of the Rebellion. That's a rebel base? But even if the First Order don't know that Crate used to be a rebel base, because, I don't know, maybe it was never publicly recorded after the war was over in some kind of historical accounting, they would still clearly see that that's where they were going, which would imply that there's something on the planet that the Resistance was after. Maybe it's another base, maybe there are more allies down there. The First Order can't possibly know that all the Resistance was on Dakar, and in fact, it's established in this film that the Resistance apparently have allies scattered around the galaxy. The scene where Poe finds out the truth is framed as though he misjudged Holdo because he didn't understand the full scope of her plan and acts like once the First Order destroys the Radis, they'll be sufficiently satisfied that the entire Resistance has been destroyed and simply pass them by. What remains of the Resistance will just hang out on Crate and wait for them to leave the system and then I guess call their allies for a ride. But no, that's just a stupid plan. The First Order would have to be composed of a bunch of brain-dead morons to not check and see what the Resistance was going after on Crate. Uh, I mean, they are brain-dead morons, but I don't... I, I don't think the film knows that, so... <laughs> There is no situation where this plan works at all. When you compare the two plans, I admit that neither of them looks particularly great, but Poe's plan is contingent on one stroke of luck that's at least within the realm of possibility, and afterwards is foolproof barring any random contrivances. Holdo's plan, by contrast, simply will not work, no matter which way you spin it. Even if Finn and Rose don't get caught causing DJ to reveal the transports, there is no outcome here where the First Order doesn't find them and corner them on Crate. So even though the film is really trying to paint it as though Poe fucked up and ruined Holdo's plan, that's just patently false. You have bet the survival of the Resistance on bad odds and put us all at risk? Oh shut the fuck up, your plan had a literal 0% chance of working. It actually is not possible to have worse odds than that, you dumb fuck. Furthermore, just as an added bonus, the desired outcomes of each plan also skew in Poe's favor, because if his succeeds, then the Rebels are able to get away without having to sacrifice the Radis, which, as far as this film tells us, is the last major warship that they have. By the end of the film, every single member of the Resistance is crammed into the Falcon, which is a pretty sad excuse of a war fleet. Even if the transports had made it down without a hitch and the First Order just passed overhead without coming down, they would still have been left stranded waiting either for Rey to come pick them up or to hear back from their allies who apparently don't give a fuck about them. I think you've got to start wondering. What the hell is this plot? So just to summarize this Poe-Holdo conflict, we're presented with this rivalry and initially meant to root for Poe at first because Holdo is mean and won't tell him what's going on, only to have an aha moment when we finally learn the truth of what she was trying to do. Turns out she was actually a hero and Poe could learn a thing or two from her. And it would be great if that arc was supported by the actual events of the film, but you know, it, it's not. So it's kind of just contorted into this weird, confused mess of a plot that thinks it's a lot more clever than it actually is. And on a larger scale, one of the main overarching themes of this film is failure and how we can learn from our mistakes and try again. Poe made a mistake by not trusting Holdo, and as a result, it cost the Resistance a lot of lives. But that theme can only exist for Poe's story as long as we accept that the alternative plan had any chance of actually working, which it didn't, and it only failed because of him, because of a major contrivance that honestly just could not have been accounted for in an otherwise mostly solid plan. The two examples I've used in this video are both small parts in their larger respective narratives, so it's not like they're entirely indicative of the overall quality of each product. To make a full assessment of that, I'd have to fully break down both and compare the two, which I'm not really looking to do right now. But I can assure you that the rest of the arcs in Andor are just as consistently well-written as the Narcina 5 storyline, Line, and the other plot
plot lines in The Last Jedi are just as, if not more nonsensical and contradictory to its own themes as what we just went over with Poe. What I hope to have illustrated here is how a well-written plot can enhance the intended themes while a poorly written one will only serve to undermine them. But of course, anyone out there who already believed that plot doesn't matter as long as the theme is good likely wouldn't have had their minds changed just because of this. So to those people, I have a few things that I just have to ask. Firstly, why doesn't plot matter? I might myself happen to be of the belief that a story's entire purpose is to convey a theme or an idea, but that that can only be achieved with a strong plot that informs the themes. The story is an amalgamation of a bunch of different things, plot, themes, character, dialogue, etc. And if it fumbles in any one of those things, I would consider it a problem, so it seems completely arbitrary to just randomly select which of those are allowed to matter when determining if a story is good or bad. If the story itself doesn't matter, if all I want to hear is interesting themes and ideas in a vacuum, I could just cut out the middleman and go listen to a TED talk. There's also a larger discussion to be had about whether or not criticism of a film is objective or subjective, and I'm not really looking to get into that right now because that's a whole other can of worms that's way too complex to break down right now. But frankly, I don't think it matters which side you land on when it comes to discussions about whether or not plot matters. Because if it's all subjective, then fine. It doesn't have to matter to you, but it matters to me, and it matters to a lot of other people, so stop telling me that it doesn't. I've had plenty of people tell me that the way I go about criticizing media is wrong because I'm too nitpicky or pedantic, or I ignore the obvious intended themes for the sake of picking apart a story that apparently doesn't even have to make sense according to them. But if it's all subjective, then this becomes entirely moot, because at that point I can just say this is how I choose to do my job, and if that's not your cup of tea, then fine. No one told you you had to watch. However, if you are someone who believes in objectively analyzing art, and you still disagree that examining the plot is important to criticism of storytelling, I'm gonna need you to, you know, qualify that and not just tell me that's the case and be done with it. That's the thing about being objective. You don't get to get away with it by just saying it's just my opinion. You have to actually show your workings. And just as a quick aside, I've always found it incredibly frustrating when people accuse me of nitpicking because nobody can ever seem to agree on what exactly that means, nor can they actually explain why it's a bad thing. The actual term term nitpicking comes from the process of painstakingly going through someone's hair and picking away lice individually, and I find that an apt way of looking at what nitpicking can actually accomplish when applied to storytelling. Because they may be small, they may just be one in a thousand, but if you miss even one or two of those little fuckers, they're just gonna multiply again, and then we're right back to square one. It doesn't matter how many lice you pick out, it doesn't matter how much mayonnaise you put on your scalp, if you don't do the necessary work to root out the base issue, you've done little more than slap a band-aid on a gaping flesh wound. Uh, I'm mixing metaphors at this point. The point is, I don't even really consider nitpicking to be a bad thing, and I'm honestly sick of this weird stigma that exists around that word as if it's some kind of plague. People often accuse me of missing the forest for the trees, and look, I'm sure it's a beautiful forest, but what if I'm so fixated on that one specific tree because it's on fire? Sure, it's just one tree, so I could probably put it out before it manages to spread, but what if it's not the only tree that's on fire? What if there are a bunch of trees all scattered around the woods that by themselves don't seem like that big a deal, but pretty quickly it spreads until there's no hope of stopping it, and now suddenly that once beautiful forest you told me to pay attention to is a blazing disaster? I'd also really like to know why it's never applied in the reverse. Like, there are a lot of little moments in stories that I really like and have praised, as I've seen others do as well, and even if they're just small moments that might not even have that much of an effect on the plot, they're are still really neat, and maybe they add to the story in other ways, and nobody ever seems to have a problem when someone praises those things, so it must just be that it's only a problem if the criticism is negative, but why? Well, there's this notion that's come to exist for whatever reason, that negative criticism of a thing is inherently bad because you yourself are spreading negativity and you're making people feel bad. It's also not necessarily great for your own mental health to constantly fixate on things you don't like, according to these people. And look, I can't speak for every single person in the world. I'm sure there are probably some people out there who are negatively affected mentally when engaging in negative criticism, either by doing the criticism 
exercising itself or watching someone else do it. And all I can really say to that person is, I'm sorry, man, that sucks. Maybe this kind of thing isn't for you. That's fine. But speaking for myself and for a lot of people I know, negative criticism can be really fun and even cathartic. I personally felt really free after finishing my Kenobi breakdowns because there was just so much I wanted to say about that show, and it felt extremely therapeutic to get all that off my chest. And I've had plenty of testimonies in the comments of those videos telling me that my breakdowns helped them work through a lot of their own feelings about the show and that it was equally therapeutic for them, which I think is great. Negative criticism is not intrinsically a bad thing, and it's no more or less toxic than positive criticism, which, by the way, can also be pretty toxic depending on how it's applied. So again, if the only real criticism you can make against my work is that it's always negative, which isn't even true, all I can really say is, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. And guess what? You still don't have to watch. So anyway, yeah, that's what's been on my mind lately. Call me crazy, I just don't think we should cherry pick which aspects of storytelling are relevant to media analysis, and I don't really like this idea that good writing doesn't actually contribute in any way to telling a good story, because that's just a big fuck you to anyone out there who actually gives a shit and tries to make their scripts as tight as possible. Apparently you put in all that extra effort for no reason, you dipshits. Didn't you know? You're not supposed to try. But I'm gonna call it here because like I said this was supposed to be a short reprieve from my massive monster of a video. Now I shall return to my dungeon cell and toil away editing a video where I explain to you all why a children's cartoon is actually not that well written. I'm coming. <laughs> Oh, and also Ahsoka is out now, so maybe I'll do a video about that soon. Okay, see ya!